in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're in now the last days of the Domitian fast, the fast where we, um, where, where we take on some additional ascetic, um, ascetic struggle in commemoration of the repose of the Mother of God. And given that we're in the last days and that we'll be celebrating this feast upcoming on Wednesday, it seems most appropriate to, to discuss why this might be. Why it might be that we, that we have this focus, um, that, that we have this reverence for, the, for Mary, the Mother of God. There's only a few scant mentions of Mary in Scripture. And this is precisely what, what it is that we should expect, um, given that the purpose of Scripture was to tell us about the resurrection. The purpose was to, to tell us how it was that salvation was possible for us. And so the details of those who were um, biologically related to Jesus simply doesn't make the New Testament. And it is as we should expect. Um, we, we want to focus here, focus in Scripture, on what it is that is, that is critical for us for our salvation. And then from there... We grow, and then from there we expand. We we accept this one thing. We accept the resurrection of Christ. What then? What else is there? And this begins our inquiry. That it's that Mary isn't mentioned very much in Scripture doesn't mean that we know nothing about her. However, there were a number of other first-century documents. The Protoevangelium of James is probably the, um, the fullest source of information that we have about the life of the Mother of God. And for, um, for details about her conception, about her parents, about her birth, um, and later on in other, other documents will tell you about her repose, which we will be commemorating in just a few short days' time. But there are some titles that, we, that, that she has um, been given over the years. The first of these is the title of Ever-Virgin. Now, we're very much used to hearing the Virgin Mary without so much of a consideration as to, what this, um, as to where this came from. We think of it as a recognition of acts not done. And it's very easy to think of it like that because that's how we would use the word to describe someone today if we were going to describe someone. At the time, though, it meant something very different. It meant someone who was consecrated to God. In Mary's case, she was consecrated to God at a very early age when she could just walk. When she could just walk, she took steps into the temple. And this is something else that you'll find in the Proto-Evangelium. She took those steps into the temple. Her parents were very old, you see. And so the temple adopted her. Essentially adopted her as a nun. This is probably the best uh, equivalence that we have in, in our understanding. And so she was there from, from that age, from that very early age, until she was betrothed um, to Joseph. A very elderly man and the the idea behind this was that you would have um, instead of having the temple take care of these consecrated virgins these uh, proto nuns if we want to use that terminology rather than that let's spread let's spread out this um, this financial burden uh, and social burden as well and so the virgin would be married into a family where there was no intention of consummating the marriage, but simply that the, uh, that the children of this elderly widower would be able to look after, um, would be able to look after the girl and later woman. And so when in the feast that we commemorate so joyously at our parish, we hear the Archangel Gabriel say, you are going to bear a son. If this was a, a girl or a woman who was about to get married, 
This would simply be good news. Marriages often result in children. This is nothing special. <coughs> However, for her, it was unusual. And her response indicates this. Because she says, for I do not know a man. <coughs> she doesn't use, for I um, have not. Um, she doesn't use, for I will not, even. But she says, for I do not. It's not part of her ontologically. It's not part of the fabric of her being. And so she had this state and continued this throughout her life. This is the reason why it is <coughs> that we talk about the, that we commemorate the ever virgin Mary. Because at no point was that marriage consummated, nor was it um, prior to that time either. We give her a second title, that of Theotokos or Theotokos, depending on who's pronouncing it. And this is a title that was defended and affirmed strongly in the mid-400s and throughout uh, the surrounding time. And the reason why we um, cling so strongly to this particular title and why this particular title is so important is because in glorifying her, we necessarily glorify Christ. By saying that the ever-Virgin Mary is the, is the Theotokos, is the bearer of God, or the birth giver of God, by saying that, we affirm that Jesus was, at all times, was God. That there was never a moment where he was not God. Never a moment when he didn't exist. But she truly and actually held God within her womb and gave birth to God. In something that hadn't been even considered <laughs> in, the, in the surrounding religions. This was not a popular idea. The opposite was popular, that God wouldn't contaminate himself, or that gods wouldn't contaminate themselves, rather, with, with humanity. They would pretend to be human, but wouldn't actually be human. This was a very familiar concept. But we said no to this. That this child was God. At the time of his conception, was God. When he first came into the world, was God. And when he will return again, is, will be, and was God. And so for this reason, we call her Theotokos, the bearer of God. There's another term that we use that's very much connected, very, very similar, sometimes even used as a translation, which is the mother of God. And, and this is more than just affirming that Christmas is real, more than just affirming that Christmas is real and Theotokos is true. When we look to Israel in the Old Testament, when we look to the time when David was king, the, the prophet and the psalmist, David, we have mentions of someone who is called queen. And yet, for, for a number of reasons that become apparent, when, when you're reading about, about David's reign, it could not have possibly been his wife or anyone he was married to. Instead, this term referred to his mother. What we today would call the queen mother. And the role of the queen, or as we, call it the, as we might call it the queen mother, the role was to intercede. Perhaps there were some things that the king had missed. It was a kingdom, after all. Perhaps there were some things that, that he missed. And so the queen or queen mother was able to bring these to his attention. And so people would be able to speak to her, who would in turn speak to the king. And so likewise, for the king of heaven, he also has a queen mother. And so, dear brothers and sisters, these titles teach us something. 
these titles are things that we are able to, to have as part of our theology and our practice of our faith. That we firstly are able to follow her example. <coughs> to follow that example of complete dedication to God. With his help to be completely dedicated to God. That secondly, we glorify her as we glorify God. And we glorify God by glorifying her as well. And lastly, that we ask for her prayers. Just in the same way that we ask for the prayers of those around us. Just in the same way that we ask for the saints, the prayers of the saints, that they intercede to God for us. So too, we ask for the prayers of his mother. As we come to the completion of this fast, may we have her intercessions and may we follow her example. Amen.